That's the hot seat. This is the easy seat over here. So let me compliment you young people on uh, your questions. We got dozens of questions from you on a whole variety of issues and topics and details. So I have to tell you in advance, we won't be able to get to all of them, but they were very good questions. I was very impressed by what your spirit was saying through the questions and uh, what your mind is trying to do in pleasing the Lord. So that's a good thing. And then Dr. Brown gave us a wonderful foundation and uh, just gave us a lot to think about today. Do you want to say anything before we get to these questions, kind of as we get started? No, sir. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. So what do we do when Christians disagree? So let's start with this one. Do you believe that there are Baptists who are going to heaven? I believe I met I met a Roman Catholic who's was born again, and uh, so I believe that they're going to come from all nations, kindred, and tongues, and wherever uh, God finds a repentant heart, a hungry heart that responds to His grace, He transforms them, and that for some reason they don't all become conservative holiness, but become followers of Jesus to the best of their ability, and I think that's the key phrase, the best of their ability. All right. So why do you think there are so many, you you mentioned conservative holiness churches, why do you think there's so many um, holiness denominations or independent churches, why are there so many, um, even in the same town, conservative holiness churches? Well, uh, let's talk about the hopeful, positive reasons. Church planting. Church planting. Uh, The real, uh, we're most comfortable around people of like interest, background, ethnic, um, economic, social, you know. Uh, I was asked by my barber this week, do you like? white beans and cornbread. <laughs> and uh, I told him I like lots of food. I didn't mention white beans. I just kind of bypassed that with a smile. One of the reasons why there's so many churches are because uh, we just are different. There's nothing in the Bible that says that uh, we all have to be of one church. Our Lord's high priestly prayer that they all might be one was one in loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and one in loving each other and others as ourselves, but not one in doctrinal uniformity, although there is one faith, one baptism, one spirit. There are some fundamental Um, foundational principles that most all Orthodox churches, whether it be Baptist, Presbyterian, uh, Pentecostal, um, Nazarene, Wesleyan, Pilgrim, uh, Independents, uh, they all adhere to those basics. But uh, I see nothing contradictory or bad about multiple churches in the same town unless those churches have been spawned by bad attitude, fractious, unbiblical handling of issues, and then what a shame that the community finds out and it, it hurts Jesus. But uh, I, did, I, did I answer the question? I, I think so. I think so. That's good. So let me, I have, I have a lot of questions that came in by text. I have some questions here on this sheet of paper, so we'll go back and forth between some of these. But I'd like for you to clarify something that you said earlier today. You said that even though there may be in some of the category three or four issues some differences, you said there still is only one right way to believe. And we live in a world where Um, it's becoming more and more popular to just say, hey, you believe what you want and you believe what you want and everything's okay. That's not what we're saying here and that's not what God's word is saying. Can you unpack that a little bit farther? 
God has uh, given us his self-revelation. Everything that is necessary for life and faith inside these two covers of this book. And God deliberately chose language. And so he expects us to uh, study and learn language. And he gave it in different genres. Some, some things are best said in poetry. Some things are best described by narrative. Some things are best described by a prophet thundering. Other things are best described by uh, the ponderings of a, of a wise man. So God's truth is multifaceted, uh, like a, a gorgeous diamond. And uh, it's simple enough so that, to put Isaiah's terminology, a wayfaring man, a traveling man, uh, we might say a homeless man or a traveling man, though he be a fool, need not err, need not be confused about the basics. But most of the things we disagree about in our circles are not the fundamental basics. We all pretty much believe you need to be born again. I mean, that's the words out of Jesus' mouth. If people disagree with that, they have a problem with Jesus, not with you or me or anybody else. So it's, it's these other issues that uh, people want to say, well, if it's such a big deal, then why didn't God say it a few more times? <laughs> you know, and then I always ask the questions, okay, so how many times are you going to tell Almighty God that he has to say something to us before you're going to take it seriously? <laughs> you know, who's calling the shots here, you or him? If, if Almighty God says it once, shouldn't that be sufficiently sufficient? It would seem so. And uh, then people say, well, if it's all that important, why didn't he make it easier to understand? Can I uh, remind you why Jesus spoke in parables? Jesus spoke in parables not to make it simple. He didn't give these illustrations parables because he was talking to these common people who were agricultural and he was going to make it simple. He talked in parables, Isaiah says, so that most people would not understand and they had to have a heart and a mind that would seek after the truth and that's what you see his disciples. He tells these parables. They all sit there, smile, nod their head and when they get in private, they finally say, hey, what were you talking about? They wouldn't say that publicly, but would you please explain what in the world this all meant? And so the, the point I'm making is that God deliberately makes some things available only to wholehearted seekers and followers of the truth. And if you're not a wholehearted, if someone is not a wholehearted seeker and follower of the truth, and as this one page, this uh, front and back, I provided for you, if your aim is primarily not to please Jesus, then your aim must be primarily to please yourself. <laughs> you know, you're interested in finding reasons and logic and arguments to support what you want it to be. And that speaks a volume we're loud words to people, and it should to yourself, about who is the focus of your life. You know, Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, you've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself is not talking about one cookie versus two cookie in the lunch line. <laughs> deny yourself doesn't mean go on a diet. Deny yourself means that anytime God's Spirit talks to you faithfully and is showing you something that needs to change, and you're doing the Gallup poll, seeing what everybody else is doing, and I, no, no other Christian seems to be concerned, and everybody else is doing this, and this can't be God. God has the right to be the Lord, 
in any of our lives, and he knows us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows what's best. And when God speaks to me, if I'm concerned about following him more than I am about having my own way, and quite frankly, you can be 100% yielded on X, Y, and Z and have some A, B, or C issues that you'd really not want to talk about with God because they're in the zone that I feel like are non-essentials. And so, folks, you and I have to be 100% yielded, walking in all the light we already have if we expect that things will become clear on these issues that Christians disagree with. And so uh, the focus, I think, should not be give me more ammunition to bolster my argument. It's rather help me to get all of the biblical data in a row and then pray for me that I'll be submissive to God and be able to hear what the Spirit wants to say to me because God is personally talking to each of us. And, And the role of the Spirit is so important if we're going to be God-centered instead of self-centered, we have to be in tune with that still small voice. And do you agree with this statement that God may ask me to do something that may not even be in his word, or he may not even ask anybody else to do it, but he may require it of me? Is that a true statement? Yes. And you see this in, in juvenile diabetes in a family, one, one child, one of my nieces, had diabetes from childhood. So the other kids could mob the donut plate and the other kid not to touch it. Well, that's not fair. I want it. You don't love me. The point is because we do love you and because you have this problem, and we're not all equal, folks. We come genetically and spiritually wired a bit differently, all of us. And God knows what's best for us, and he's never trying to put us in a box, a legalistic box to rob the joy out of life. That's what the devil will tell us he's doing, but he loves us, and it's like telling a child, you know, don't get too close to the edge of the cliff. Why? Because we don't want you to enjoy looking over and even learning how to fly. <laughs> you know, you're going to land with a thud. That's right. And we're, so we love you. And this is God. God loves you, and he loves me. Amen. And he only wants the best. So anything he asks us to do or not to do, assuming it's God, then we need to do that. All right. So here's a question. My pastor says that those who disagree with our standards or our way of life do not have the same light as we do. I thought God's word was a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Aren't they reading the same Bible that we read? What is their excuse? Okay. That's, that's, uh, we, we, that's hinges on a definition of light. Yes, God's word provides light. How many times have you read something in this book that never clicked the application until a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, 27th reading or somebody preaches on it, suddenly you see it in a new way. So light is not simply something that a person, because they open the pages, suddenly receive the light. It takes the help of the Holy Spirit working in our brain for it to, to penetrate, to, to become light to us. And uh, so, this is where uh, I define light as biblical information plus Holy Spirit illumination helping you and I to understand the information. And once that clicks, then that's light to me. Now I have received light. But I could be reading lots of things and it not click. So I didn't have the light on it yet. So that's why our approach to others needs to be kindness and graciousness. 
as we interact with them. All right, around those same lines, here's another question. Uh, we have a good pastor. I really like my church, but it's hard to figure out sometimes if what my pastor preaches is actually scriptural principle or just his personal preference. I'm not trying to rebel against how I was raised, but some of the things that he preaches about, I cannot find any reference to them in the Bible. What should I do? You need to understand that there's nothing wrong with you. Sounds like you're intelligent. Number two, you need to pray for your pastor. Your pastor has many pressing uh, competitive things vying for his time and his attention. And depending on his personality and his training, he may not he may not be gifted at explaining the whys. And that's always tragic because a person who is smart enough to understand that what he's saying is not backed up by Scripture needs to have the opportunity to, to talk with the pastor and ask him questions, but not all Pastors welcome that, probably because of insecurity and a lack of ability to answer questions on the spur. And so, again, let's give pastors a break. Even though they do some things poorly, they do other things well. Uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Talk to people who can give you the answers and grow. Pray for the pastor. Be glad for what he does do and say that's biblical. And uh, you try to set a better example in, in your life. So you're saying you should study God's word yourself, not just listen to your pastor? That's right. <laughs> that's that's good. good. All right, here's another question. Um, this person was in your message in the service this morning. They said, some people seem to think that truth trumps kindness. Is this accurate? What about those who use the truth as a bludgeon or a billy club? If it's true, we're going to stand yes. right here. Truth is always to be treasured. And Proverbs 23, 23, by the truth. And sell it not. Of course, what I tell my students, buying the truth sometimes is like, buy a bag of gold ore. Well, what in the world does gold ore look like, and where do we find gold ore? And, 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 and Proverbs chapter 2 says that biblical wisdom is uh, found only when you look for it like silver and gold. And that doesn't mean asking your dad for money for a date. Uh, you're looking for it in the mountains. And that requires a lot of knowledge. And so you and I have to learn how to mine the scriptures, read the scriptures. We need, we need to find some friends who will discuss the scriptures we need to get some good commentaries that will give us other insights and be able to discuss that. We need to be talking a lot about what we believe because iron sharpens iron and, and we can and be balanced, get, get balanced in another perspective if we um, will only talk about these things like we're doing now. Um, you mentioned the categories of truth out of Romans chapter 14. Um, this person... May I interrupt? I, I, sure I switched. Uh, Dr. Phil came up with those categories, my son. And I told him, Phil, I don't like the title truth. I want everybody to know that truth is truth, whether it's the most important truth or okay. less important truth. And if we put categories of truth, it begins to sound like maybe all truth is not as important. Okay. And so I want to talk, all truth is important, 
So I want to talk about categories of exegetical certainty. Uh, what can we know for sure that if people don't agree with their... Apostate. Yes. And what is it that good people disagree with on the basis of reading the same scripture? That's exegesis, interpretation. Why do we interpret it differently? I, I want us to know that the, the truth never changes, and all truth is important truth. So let's, I'm not, okay. I'm picking got, at got, a word, no, no, not finding fault. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we called it for a good while, okay? But th these categories of exegetical certainty, go ahead. So category one, we would never allow a, um, a Muslim cleric to come and participate or speak at Youth Challenge because they disagree on what level of truth? On category one, the fundamentals that the Bible says that if you bid them, if you call them a brother, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. So that's, you know, that's scary, isn't it? Yeah. So you can be kind and nice and friendly and at the same time not admit them, admit that they are as much Christian as Jesus requires people to be to be a Christian because they're not. So what if you were invited to a community service, maybe there's some tragedy or something, and they invited you to participate in that service to pray or something, and there were other religions present who did not fall into category one truth, they apostate according to scripture, what would be your response to that? Without further qualifications, just taking that in the simplest form, uh, I see we're called to be salt, we're called to be light. Uh, our communities are very much needing good example. So I personally would have no qualms about participating in the, if it was not around like a con, we're all Christians doing this together. But, but we're all concerned citizens. We're all, we're all sad over this tragic incident or we're all promoting this needful um, kindness that I think, I think Christians should be right there uh, being a good example. So that's category one. So here at Youth Challenge, we would not invite someone to preach or teach who is going to um, promote. You, you mentioned earlier today about um, uh, Calvinist theology, Calvinistic theology. We would not invite someone to preach that theology here at Youth Challenge because we don't believe it. We don't believe that's what God's Word says. Right. Right. So this is, these are people that believe that they, Jesus died for their sins. They believe they've confessed their sins. Um, are we correct in, in excluding them from our... I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just going to give you a chance to elaborate on that. Can we still treat them as Christians, even though for sure we would not have them speak and teach and preach uh, from our platform here? Yes. Uh, we might have them speak on a subject that was not contrary to what we understand. Uh, David Gibbs, who is a Baptist, speaks at some of our... But we never ask him to preach on once saved, always saved, no matter how you live, please. Tell us how <laughs> unconditionally we're secure. We, we don't ask, He stays off that subject. He, he is a man of wisdom and grace and speaks on subjects that are not offensive that we have a common agreement with. And that's called courtesy. That's called ethical integrity. That's called kindness. He knows why we invited him. And we might well invite somebody to Youth Challenge who's a Muslim. If we were going to have a Muslim and a Hindu and then um, Brother Heath, representing Christianity, uh, address what's the... Is, Islamic view on this, what's the Hindu view on this, and what is the Christian view on this. That would be possible, but everybody would know you're not saying this guy's a good Christian, this guy's a good Christian, this is a good Christian, and we pick uh, anyone you want of those three, and, and 
they're good examples for what we're trying to produce. They're not good examples. Right. And so did that answer it? I think so. So then we get down to category of, of exegetical certainty. certainty. That's a really long term there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's not as exciting as the other. All the 13 and 14 year olds are going to remember that after this. Um, this person sent this in. If I am in a relationship with someone and I disagree with them on not category one or two, but categories three or four issues, should I end that relationship or is it permissible to continue in that relationship? I'm assuming it's a dating relationship. Dating relationship. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, th that, all, that all depends on. Uh, uh, you're to honor your father and your mother. So, but let's just assume your father and your mother don't uh, just like this person for some reason. Okay. Um, it depends. Uh, this is wisdom decision. You're going to reap what you sow. Your decisions will have impact. Uh, Illustrate it. My son Philip, he tells the story himself, so he wouldn't mind me telling it. Abbreviated, was the designated driver for the church. They gave him a car while he was at the university, and any of the university students who wanted to come to church would ride with him. And so this um, free Methodist girl uh, heard about the church and easily and starts riding with him and she begins to ask him questions about uh, why do the women wear their hair up and why don't they wear jewelry and why don't this you know and uh, just good questions and Philip was giving the biblical basis for those uh, choices and why in scripture and that people would make that and in the process you know what happens you can become good friends and then pretty soon you can find you're, you're really liking the person. And uh, she began to really admire Philip, and he began to really like her. And he talks to me and Nadine about this, this gal. He says, Dad, you know, I've made a commitment. I'll never, we'll never, I'll never marry someone that you and Mom don't fully agree. And uh, I'm... She's got a wonderful mind. I really enjoy talking with her. She loves the Lord, uh, except, you know, that she doesn't hold the same view on, on some of these dress issues that we hold. But she said, out of respect for me, that she would restrict her liberty and wouldn't do these things if it would be a hindrance to his ministry. I mean, isn't that gracious? Isn't that flexible? That was awesome. But I said to him, Philip, I said, you have children, maybe. Mama, what's wrong with wearing a necklace? Well, honey, I think you'll probably need to talk to Daddy. Uh, kids aren't stupid. That immediately told her that Mama didn't think anything was wrong with it. Daddy is, is the, the bugaboo here. <laughs> and I said, you know what happens? A house divided against itself can't stand. How do you want your children to turn out? If, if you're not united, I mean, not just in flexibility, but on the same page of teaching, then your children will have a potpourri from which they can select and there's no real directed guidance. So I said, son, I am opposed to it. He said, thank you. All right. And he broke up. And many tears. And I felt like a bum. <laughs> I, felt, I felt like a bum. But I felt like... And wife agreed with me. We felt like that was the right choice. And now, 15, 17 years later... He says, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. You might think, well, you were a bum. <laughs> uh, you broke up something that was beautiful. <laughs> we all have to make choices. And then we have to live with our choices. I'm liking the product, 
that I'm receiving. Most people don't like the product that they have. So I'm not asking you to agree with what I said or what I did. I'm just telling you, you're going to have to make those calls yourself. But just remember this. You will live with what you decide. So you're not saying that just because it's category three or four of interpretation, category three or four is not as clearly spelled out in Scripture. It's a little hard to understand. You're not saying that those things, just because they're category three and four, are unimportant. That's right. To some people, they're unimportant. And they just... To me, because most of these issues have underneath a principle to guide that uh, they're not unimportant to me. So the principle, you can unpack this one. The, ch the principle for gender distinct clothing is not a category one in your, your mind, but it's important. What's the underlying principle? Unpack that just to, for a few minutes for us. And, and that's what the, the, the principle is that in every culture, there is to be, according to God, a distinctive dress for men and a, dis and a distinctive dress for women. Uh, the distinctive item may vary from culture to culture. And I think anybody who looks at cultures understand that. Uh, my uh, daughter-in-law who married my youngest son was talking to gal uh, and what would you think somebody's walking away from you they have on a ball cap they have on a pair of jeans and they have a jacket Who, which gender oh that's a boy and then the girl said she wore jeans and ball caps she said you know just the other day I was mistaken for a boy and she said, I get the point that in our culture, there is still something that if you're wearing it, you could be mistaken for the wrong gender, okay? And so anybody who says there's no such thing as gender distinct clothing is living in la-la land. Uh, they need to come to planet Earth. However, the, 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 the difficult question is, isn't it possible for that, those gender distinct clothing to change? Can't. As long as it's gender specific, can't there be a shift? And I would say, evidently, yes. But I, I would say, here's probably the principle. Until there is a clear replacement for what in our culture has been pants for men and a dress for women. Now, obviously, we all heard the arguments. There are women's pants designed for women etc., 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 and no man would be caught dead in these pants for women, etc. We all know these arguments. I don't know. Have you been at Walmart recently? <laughs> <laughs> we all know these arguments, and I understand them. Uh, but, but the point is, what is the substitute? You know, what, what is the visual substitute on restrooms now? Um, so you sometimes see a pipe... Uh, so what's, what's it going to, what is the, and I don't think that we in our culture have that clearly new distinctiveness. And so then if we don't, you're going to have to make the choice. Whatever I do, I need to be pleasing Jesus. Jesus, are you pleased with what I'm wearing? In light of this principle, what do you think about this? Not what are all my friends doing, but what do you think and how can I please you, Lord? And whatever you say, I'll do. So here's a question. If other Christians are going to heaven without the standards that we believe, why can't we believe like them? I think that's a great question. I frequently said to the Lord, if you let in the thief on the cross with the simple statement, I think he was immodest at that point, too. Yeah. <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. That's good. That's good. 
if he's going to let that immodest thief on the cross. <laughs> and simply because he said, after he'd been jeering at Jesus, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That wasn't in one of these questions either, but <laughs> let me say this. Let me say this. We're wired somehow. I'm not sure. I don't want to be harder on us than I, uh, that I should be. We're wired for fairness. Man, we want, we want people to be fair. We're not wired for justice. We're wired for fairness. And how is it fair that Timothy LeVay can blow up people, terrorists, and then in prison, get saved, be executed, and go to heaven? That's not fair. You see what I mean? And, and it reminds me of what Jesus said. And, and you need to meditate. We, we need to meditate on Jesus' story about the guy who makes a deal with some day workers at 6 o'clock in the morning, you work a day and I'll give you one day's wage and here's how much it is. Deal? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And then he goes out and he finds some people at 9 o'clock and he says, um, go to work in my field and I'll pay you what's right. No deal. 12 o'clock, go out in my field, work, I'll pay you what's right. And at 3 o'clock, go out in my field, I'll pay you what's right. At 6 o'clock, pay time comes. <laughs> and the guy begins with the three o'clocker and gives them a full day's wage. And the guys who've been there since six in the morning say, wow, if he gives them a full day wage, he's going to give us a lot more. That's cool. And then they watch him at noon give the guy a full day's wage. And then the people at nine o'clock a full day's wage. And when the people come up that have been out there for 12 hours and he gave them a full day's wage, they complain, that's not fair. Don't, now, don't you relate to that? Sure. And here's what the Lord said. Do you begrudge me for being generous, merciful, and kind? That's not fair for me to be merciful and kind when I paid you what we agreed on. I have not in any way shortchanged you. I have fulfilled our contractual obligation. But you don't like it if I'm merciful and more kind to others than you think I ought to be. And I think that boils down to the question, you know, how can these people go to heaven who get to do all of these unbiblical things and still go to heaven? That's not right. I want to do all those unbiblical things too. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's significant. Uh, God knows the heart. You and I don't know who's going. We don't know who's gotten there except Moses and Elijah because they came back on the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> and so, uh, do you begrudge God being merciful to people who don't have the privilege of knowing what you have? Uh, mark this down, students. This is important. Every area of your life, anyone's life that's in harmony with this book receives a special blessing. And to the degree that any of our lives are not in harmony in any area with this book, we don't receive that blessing, but we do receive God's blessings for what's in harmony. Now, which do you want? You want minimal blessings? and maximal ignorance claim that you didn't know any better and all of the attendant problems that come from not knowing any better? Is that what you want to reap? I don't. I want maximum alignment and maximum blessing and all the good I can get out of God and from God here and the joy. And when I go to heaven... Here, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm not going to be comparing myself with people who know less and still get to heaven. I've been privileged. We are privileged to whatever light we receive. What a privilege. 
so light is not a burden. Light is actually a blessing because it allows us to be more pleasing to the that God is who right. created and, and more blessed. That's good. That's good. I'm into being blessed, aren't you? <laughs> so the rules and regulations viewpoint is actually, it's the wrong perspective. Totally wrong. But that's, that's where we, we start off because Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Why? Next phrase. We've all sought our own way. We come hardwired from the womb wanting our own way, self-centered. And anything that keeps us from getting our own way irritates us and is and chafes us and is restrictive. And consequently, when we get saved, we now want to be a Christian, a good Christian, as we define it. <laughs> Not as God defines it, as we define it. And we run all of Scripture through our self-centered, self-interested mind and we end up figuring out how this is okay and that's okay and, and what all. When, and then the Holy Spirit faithfully working on us says, why don't you present your body a living sacrifice now that you're saved? Why don't you give me everything unreservedly? And so we say, well, Lord, okay. And we do that. And suddenly the Holy Spirit begins opening up other aspects of truth to our mind that we never saw. And we begin to see and hear the Spirit in areas we couldn't hear and, and really didn't want to hear before. But now we're open and willing. And people experience change and blessed change because now their heart has been further helped. Let's open a can of worms here. Okay. My church loves organ music. That wasn't very funny, but somebody's laughing. What if I don't care for organ music? Is it okay to listen to other types of Christian music? Well, I have a, a sheet of questions to ask. You know, all things uh, within certain parameters are lawful, but all things are not expedient. So some things you have to ask is, is this uh, other kind of music you like, like helping you Closer to God? Uh, does it, uh, is it a good influence on others who hear it? I hear students talking about uh, some of their Christian friends when they walk in. Uh, they hear them listening to music that shocks them. They don't think that that is appropriate, but obviously the person who was playing the music, listening to it, earphones, whatever, and they could hear it coming past the earphones, um, they must think it's okay, assuming they're saying, I'm walking in the light and I'm loving Jesus, and this is the kind of music I like. Well, uh, you, you, here's, let me give you a passage of Scripture that talks about music. Ephesians 5.18 talks about Christians, after you're saved, should be filled with the Spirit. And filled with the Spirit implies every area of your life yielded. And the characteristics that the Spirit wants to bring out to a Spirit-filled life are these. And this is one of the passages that says, here's the kind of fruit that comes out of a Spirit-filled life. That you... Talk and speak to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, and there's your music, under the Lord. And so some of the questions we have to ask us is not, is this labeled Christian? We have to ask, what are the lyrics saying? What is the music without the lyrics saying and doing. 
uh, to you. And then what kind of influence does this have on my friends around me? All of those things have to be part of the filters of making it this choice. I want to add to that just a little bit. Music is very powerful. And the reason it's powerful is because it touches our emotions. That's why Christmas music, by the way, how many of you have already listened to Christmas music? This proves the point. We like the way we feel when we listen to Christmas music because we remember the presence and the, as long as they're okay with celebrating Christmas. People you talked about this morning may not have been, but music I'm is... I'm okay with it. All right. <laughs> music is powerful. And sometimes before you're a Christian, you have a certain genre of music that you listen to. You give your heart to the Lord and he's redeeming all of your life, your actions, your reactions, and also your emotions. And sometimes if you listen to Christian words, but the music is the same, it brings up all of these negative and sinful emotions. And so I, have, I know of a lot of Christians that have to change their style of music simply because it puts them in the wrong emotion. It brings up these memories and they have to fight spiritual battles. And it's not necessarily that the words are wrong or whatever, but they have to actually change. And that's why a lot of uh, Christians that have been saved from the world, they can't hardly listen to anything with, you know, um, I'll just be controversial here, any kind of per percussion or drums or whatever. They go straight to organ music because that's what they needed to do to foster their, their relationship with the Lord. I grew up in a Christian home, and so I don't have... Uh, background in music from bars and stuff. And so I will hear even what you would probably consider jazz music. It doesn't bring back any negative emotions. I'm not tempted to do any sinful activity. It's like, oh, that's, that's a great uh, Christmas song or whatever. And maybe you all feel the same way. How can we be kind to one another in this area of music without being judgmental? Excellent question. I face that with my children. Uh, I'm sitting in the parking lot outside a uh, store that has uh, all kinds of stuff that women really enjoy. And I didn't want to go in with my wife. It's at night. And my two sons didn't want to go in for some reason. Nadine's inside. And so I'm sitting there. And I turn on the radio. And I'm just kind of watching uh, and, and kind of daydreaming. And felt, I hear this voice in the back seat saying, Dad, do we have to listen to that kind of music? I come back to planet Earth. It was just a little bit of jazzy, but it was easily listening music. I made the decision that the person that something bothered their conscience in our family would be the guiding light we wouldn't stifled them, we would restrict our liberty out of kindness to them, and instead of feeling my son is trying to chasten me and guide me and all that kind of stuff, that I could have had those thoughts, instead of I just said, well, oh, no, I'm sorry, and I turned it off. And I said, Philip, I would never want to have any music that in any way bothered you. Thank you for saying something. I wasn't really even listening to it. I was tuned out. So what am I saying? I'm saying your conscience is not the only thing involved. Good point. We need to be thoughtful and kind and, and considerate of people around us. Uh, and what you do alone then that's between you and God. And you work that out with him. But you need to know that what you do in the presence of other people can have a, a negative effect, and you need to be sensitive to that. That's good. How do you apply that same principle to movies? This has not entered into any question any young person has asked today. But I know it's a factor in Satan, that Satan uses to trip our young people up. I mean, we are a very visual generation that's sitting here today. 
Boy, that's a, that's a hot button one. Jesus, let's go watch the movie. Let's, we're, 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 if we're Christians, Jesus is right there with us. Yes? Yes. So, Jesus, let's go watch this movie. Oh, Lord, don't look at that. Don't, don't, don't look at that. Sorry. Sorry, Lord. Oh, don't listen to that, Lord. Oh, that's bad language. Oh, sorry, Lord. How sensitive or desensitized has the world made us to where we derive our entertainment and relaxation with things that are not pure, lovely, wholesome. And when you say something like that, it feels like a real downer because there goes about every nifty movie, you know. And that's not really true. But my question comes up, are we not to, in everything we do, do all to the glory of God, hold fast that which is good? Amen. <laughs> Here's one thing I know. For those young people that God is helping, and maybe at Youth Challenge you've gotten spiritual help, if you don't change the music you listen to and the movies that you watch, the spiritual help that you get at youth camp or youth challenge will not last. True. I know that for a fact. Okay, moving on. Here's another one. If someone comes from a conservative background, but they've strayed away from that in some matters like Dressing immodestly, for example. Are they still a Christian? They claim to be. Yes. Good question. I remember that's always been a question that comes up to any thinking people's minds. And the standard answer that a lot of times you hear, oh, well, they knew. They, they were raised better than that. And they're, they're compromisers. They're, they're deceived. And... and you know what I, just, I decided personally after entertaining that that all these people are deliberately walking against light and they knew better after teaching uh, so many young people who came out of our best holiness homes who had no clue for the biblical basis for modesty for the adornment issue for gender distinct clothing Give me the book and the chapter and the verses that discuss the, the, the... They had no idea. They all knew rules, but they had no biblical exposure. Their pastors never gave them a biblical exposition. For the most part, I'm sure there's exceptions. And so what I decided is that most of these people who have changed their lifestyle, who once were conservative and now are from the conservative viewpoint more worldly. I believe that most of these people never turned their back on truth that they knew was God's word. But when the church as a whole began to shift and say things are not any, this isn't wrong, this is okay, this is... And, and, that they just fit in as they fit in this conservative mode. They went along. They were good people. They're not going to make any waves. And if this is the rules, then we'll keep the rules. But when the rules change, we'll also change because it was never biblically based to start with in their mind. Now, that's the kindest construction I know to put on it, that people were not taught Scripture. And this is why uh, at God's Bible School... I asked Philip to make sure we have a whole semester on principles of the Christian life where we deal with these issues on a biblical basis after we've had a semester on how to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors yourself. So how do you love God with all your heart, mind, and your neighbors yourself in modesty? How do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors yourself in adornment? How do you love God... 
instead of discussing these issues as issues over here, let's tie them to where they need to be tied. I'm to love God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and my neighbor as myself, and reflect that love by how I do in these other areas. And as a result of that, we give exegesis, Kids are allowed to ask any questions they want before, during, and after the exegesis. And we don't require anybody to agree with what the teacher is saying. We just want them exposed to a solid, sensible, scriptural reason based upon the context they'd never heard before. And many of the kids... Appreciate that. Respond. Say, and tuck it in. Others? Well, I disagree with that. And shrug it off. That's, that's a God issue. That's not a, a me versus you issue. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. There are some scripture verses that we refer to as the separation passages, the, the verses that tell us we are to have no association. There's a question in here somewhere. I can't find it right now. Someone wants to know, at what point do we separate from those that we disagree with? I I mean, to the point where we don't have any fellowship. I'm not talking about necessarily, do we have them on our platform, those kind of issues. I'm talking about friendships, relationships. We don't say hi. We don't don't unfriend them on Facebook. I, I don't know that a Christian ever comes to a place where you're not kind and loving and gentle. I hear about these people who haven't spoken to each other. That is nothing but unadulterated sin. Mm -hmm. At least on the part of one person. Doesn't have to be sin on the part of, you know, if I speak and you refuse to respond, that's your problem, not mine. If I've tried to make peace and bridge the, and you refuse, I'm clear before God. But I'm still going to be nice and I'm still going to speak. Sure. And, and so uh, I don't think that uh, I think that we ought to stop unchristianizing people unless they violate category one passages of behavior. So if they claim to be a Christian and they want to teach Sunday school but they're living in adultery, biblical grounds. Biblical grounds, I'm sorry. If they profess to be a Christian and live in adultery, then we rebuke them and we can treat them like a sinner but kindly and pray for them to repent. Paul said, I turned over one man to the devil for him to destroy his body so that when he knows he's dying, he will be concerned about eternity and repent and get right with God. I mean, it's far better to uh, have some terrible disease that lets you know you're dying and then you get serious than be healthy and happy all the way into hell. That's true. Okay, let's open another can of worms. Let's talk about politics for a moment. We live in a very divided uh, country right now. But the truth is, if you study our history of our country, we've been divided many, many different times. Um, Should a Christian vote only for Democrats? Good question. Or only Republicans? Each of us need to function as salt and light. So bottom line, everyone that can vote should vote because failing to vote means you're allowing the powers of darkness to prevail. And you'll meet that at the judgment. In our culture, where we have the right to vote, part of our salt and light, as I see Scripture, in retarding the corruption of the world system is to vote for the best candidate that you can find. Uh, 
What if I like a different candidate than you do? Each of us are going to be accountable to God for our thought processes and our choices. If you're not running it through a biblical grid of thinking, but just through an economic grid or, or your, your compassion grid or something, then you're not thinking biblically. Uh, I'm not going to unchristianize you. In fact, I probably won't even discuss politics with you because I want to be, have a peaceful discussion. And, and politics generally um, it becomes very heated. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I want to be kind and gracious and gentle. I, I think what we, we need to know, however, is that the Bible clearly addresses how we talk about people in public office. It's true. Uh, people who are who like the conservative talk host people um, or, or, or the liberal talk host people. Uh, they refer, they're not Christians to start with, and they refer to the president or the people that they, they I remember hearing uh, them, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, Slick Willie, uh, I hear Christians mouthing that phrase, and the Bible says, honor the king, which means the people in civic office, that office is ordained of God, government is ordained of God, and God put them in there, and God puts bad people in positions many times, that how you talk about it is going to be evaluated by the Word of God, and so you can disagree totally with a person in the office and not respect the person, but talk about them since they're office holders with respect that that office is due, which doesn't mean you're placing any approval on the person who you think is totally corrupt and horrible, but you never found Paul bad-mouthing Nero who was a psychophant, he was unbalanced. He, he was the epitome of, of evil. Sure. Paul never bad mouths the guy and makes jokes about him. And Christians ought not to do that. And if we've been doing that, it's high time we repent and stop. So politics is not a category one <laughs> exegetical search. <service. laughs> no, but it certainly involves principles from category two and sure. three. About and, and unfortunately, when we discuss at, as Christians, we discuss our different views. It takes a nosedive away from graciousness and kindness, and we begin to vilify one another. That's the thing that I'm most... Um, aggravated about in the whole political sphere. It's not that a person disagrees with me or votes differently than me. It's that we can't even have a civil discussion. And we have to make sure we understand it is not a category one truth. It is not in the separation passages of Scripture. That's right. It should be something we can talk about and iron sharpen iron, as you said, and we come to some, maybe some agreement or maybe not. We can agree to disagree. And, um, okay, we'll move on um, to something a lot less controversial, maybe. I noticed that you preached from, this morning, you preached from the King James Version of the Bible. But you also mentioned something about different ones reading other, other versions of the Bible. Um, are you advocating we should only read the King James, or are you okay with other translations? And is this category one or two or three or four or seven or ten? Yes. It's, uh, no, I am you not want me a to king. skip this question? No, no, no. I'm just trying to be kind. <laughs> I brought King James. 
deliberately because I thought there might be some young people who come from King James only churches. And I wanted to be able to be a good guy in their minds. I prefer the Greek and the Hebrew text. <laughs> okay, Sin argument's Sin over. <laughs> Sincerely. But I, I don't, I don't low-rate King James. It's just the King James. The, 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 the versions were designed to help the common man know the truth. And the King James is the acme of the English language. It's Elizabethan English. It is beautiful Elizabethan English. Chinese students in China, I wanted to know what version they would prefer when they finally asked me to teach uh, Old Testament background to interpreting British literature. They said, we want the King James Version. I said, why? It sounds holy. <laughs> Doesn't it? Listen to people pray. We thank thee, O God, for thy goodness. We switch in our prayer to holy language, which was every, everyday <coughs> language. In 1611, nothing holy sounding about it. But now it just sounds holy. And listen to people pray. They switch into King James. Don't I'm not making fun. But I'm telling you, we get conditioned and we think that there's something special about the these and the thines and doest and all those Elizabethan phrases when there's nothing special about it. It's how they spoke back then. And we need people reading a language, that vocabulary that they can understand. What good is it to read something and you get nothing from it? And so I'm for people reading whatever version it makes is the most readable. Read through it, and as you grow in the Lord, you might want to try another version that balances it. And so, no, I'm not a King James only. In classroom, I typically use the English Standard Version or the New American Standard Version or the Greek or the Hebrew We've had this question asked of us, you know, at Youth Challenge uh, from time to time over the years. And, and probably our preference would be most of our speakers would use the King James like you did today. Um, but we have chosen as an organization not to make it something we're going to divide over. We're not going to make it a divisive issue. Um, I think that it's reasonable for there to be arguments or, or discussion about how the King James may be uh, the best translation. There's a lot of study about that. But I think it's unreasonable to argue that the King James Version is the only translation that we should read. Because the majority of Christians down through history did not have the privilege of reading the King James because it wasn't around in the early church. I do think we don't want to belittle the King James Version because God has mightily used it um, amongst us. So you might be here today and your pastor uses the King James very strongly. Please understand, we highly respect that. Um, I don't get any amens or anything on that one. but um, Amen. Thank you. But God's Word is God's Word, and it will not return void. And in fact, there's millions of Christians today who have no access to the King James because they don't read English. So, okay. That one was a little more quiet than I thought it would be, but that's okay. One more. Um, are you all okay for a few more minutes longer? I have some more questions. So, this person would like to know, what do you do if your parents have different beliefs or convictions than you do? And I'm assuming these are more category three for personal conviction levels. That could go two ways, you know. Are your parents uh, more um, worldly or 
uh, don't uh, see the same things you see. Uh, your parents could be that way, or your parents could be more uh, conservative, if that's the word we want to use, and, and uh, ask you to conform and live a certain, in certain areas that you don't see from the Word of God. So, whichever way you go, uh, you've got to honor your father and your mother. And if you're living at home, that puts you in a different category, in a different relationship than if you're not living at home. And when you get married, you leave and cleave. But at no time until they're dead do you cease to honor them. God chose which father, which mother you were to have. And God expects us to learn how to function within the situation he places us again. Learn to appeal to your authority. Daniel is the example. Daniel was placed under Ariok, the eunuch who is in charge of the king of Babylon's young men that were in training. And Ariok said, you're going to eat this food and drink this liquid in order to be healthy and strong and flourish. And Daniel felt like this was a violation of what he'd been taught. And obviously, he'd been taught by somebody, his parents, I'm assuming, the, what the Scripture said. And so he doesn't rebel. He doesn't say to Ariok, I'm going to mind God. I'm not going to do what you said. He appeals to the authority. He, he tries to figure out what is it that the goal is here. Is there another way of meeting that goal that doesn't violate God's word and my conscience? And he suggested Sir, could we try an experiment of just a few weeks of eating this and drinking this instead of what you're suggesting? And then you can check us, and if we're not where you want us to be, then we'll face it then. But if we are, then we could continue. Because he had such an excellent attitude, no rebellious spirit, no defiance. And that's crucial. No defiant attitude. God touched Ariok's heart, so she said, let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. And lo and behold, God blessed until... Now, I'm not saying it always will work out that way, but that's where you need to start. You need to appeal. My grandma on my mother's side tells me the story. She got saved. She loved her dad dearly. She was dad's only daughter, favorite daughter, and... Every Saturday, or every Sunday, Saturday, I don't know which day it was, but uh, he'd ask her to go down to the um, pub and bring home a pail of beer, a pail. So that was a long time ago. And when she got saved, God talked to her and said, uh, Jesse, I don't want you doing this anymore. And so she went in and said to her dad, Daddy, you know, I love you. I love Jesus, and I want to please you, and I've always been happy to do what you've asked me to do. And Jesus tells me, he doesn't want me getting you beer. He doesn't want me going into the pub and bringing the beer home. And, Daddy, I'm so sorry, but I got to do what Jesus says. Now, Jesse, my grandmother, was willing to take whatever punishment, but she said it with an attitude of love, submission, and desire to please her dad. And her dad said, okay, Jesse, if that's how you feel, I'll get it myself. God's, do you have a big God? Can God turn the heart of the king like he turns the course of the river? The Bible says he can. And if you will have the right attitude and pray and faith and believe, God can move on the hearts of your parents. And so you can see miracles. And he can move on your heart too. Amen. Amen. Um, how do we apply this idea of being kind and gracious and non-judging and yet holding to biblical standards? How do we apply that in the area of social media? 
Are you on Facebook? Only when I accidentally sit on my iPad. <laughs> Pardon my... Do you know what social media is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I do. I got off of social media. Here was my experience. When it was out, I, I had a presence. And I didn't know that people could write on your wall things unless you turned it off. And so here I find out that somebody puts a prayer request, and I wasn't checking regularly, and one of my former parishioners, I'm told by others who are on the social media regularly, have you seen what's on your wall, Dr. Brown? I said, no. Well, one of your former parishioners wrote, don't ask Dr. Brown to pray for anything on social media. He'll never see it, and he'll never pray for you. Well, I needed that kind of vote of confidence, like a <laughs> hole in the head. And so I found out how to turn everything off except my picture, and I am on social media. I'm just not active. How many of you are on social media? How many of you are active? All right. Be honest. How many of you have already checked your social media at least once today? So how do we apply this, this idea of kindness and graciousness even in this new form of communication? It's never right to do wrong even when you're typing it and putting it out there. Always be Christ-like. Always be kind. Always be gracious. And if you can't do that, then stop being unbiblical on Facebook. You know, you, you, uh, you damage your testimony publicly by un, 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 probably, maybe it's, maybe it's not deliberate, and maybe it's tongue-in-cheek, and maybe you don't know any better, and maybe you didn't mean it to sound as bad as it sounds. And there's the problem with the printed social media. Uh, lots of people have damaged their, <coughs> their reputation and testimony because they weren't thinking about how it sounded. And I, I am very hesitant in what I say in an email. Emails, it's so impersonal. And, and nobody can hear my tone of voice, and I can't read any feedback. Is this uh, uh, positive received or negative? Do I need to change? can't do any of that on social media. So, bottom line, if you're going to use it, use it uh, and set the example of how to communicate in a gracious, kind manner. Good admonition. You okay with one more? Two more? How many of you are ready to go eat lunch or supper, I mean? Some of you are. Um, this one seems a little bit, this one just came in a few minutes ago. Um, at, at first glance, I wasn't even sure we should talk about it, but it's, it seems like a deep spiritual topic, but if it comes from a young person, I think it's pretty important. What is the difference between a willful sin and an unwillful sin? Especially from our Wesleyan Arminian perspective. Well, that's a uh, hot button subject. It, it, do you want a Wesleyan answer or do you want a biblical answer? Moving on. Well, we definitely want a biblical answer. Let me start with a Wesleyan answer. Okay. We want a, we want a Wesleyan answer then, yes. Go Wesleyan ahead. answer. Go, go to Wesley's sermon on Christian perfection, and he'll tell you that uh, there are various kinds of sins, and he'll talk about sins that you know are violations of God's will, and he calls that a sin rightly so-called. And, and what Wesley means by a sin rightly so called is what will be imputed to your account before God. 
Then he'll talk about things that uh, violate the standard of God's word, which the word of God calls sin. But it's not intentional and it's not purposeful. And we know the Bible says that if you walk in the light as he's in the light, that unintentional violations are automatically cleansed. So Wesley wanted to stress to his people that what will separate you from God is not your ignorance, things you don't know, it's what you do know and you do anyway. And so in the Wesleyans, we came up with uh, sin is only a willful transgression of a known law of God. Well, that's certainly a sin. Nobody would deny that is one way of sinning, and that's right uh, on the subcategory of a high-handed sin because if you know something's wrong and do it anything, you're, you're, you're on that verge. So uh, if you don't know, like the Ephesians. Paul says, now that you're saved, stop your lying. Um, stop your stealing. Work with your hands to labor so you have not only to pay your bills but to give to others. How can Paul say to Christians who are saved, stop lying, stop stealing? Well, obviously they're pagans. And all pagans knew there's, there's a wrong kind of stealing, and then there's liberating things, you know, like people talk today, or, or borrowing and never returning, and, and polite lying. And, and, What's a polite lie? Polite, but well, that's in the Asian culture where you say face. You say what the person, you know they want to hear. You don't tell them something negative. Like, you look really nice today. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, I understand. Okay. He just wanted, to, isn't that awful? <laughs> now, the Bible calls that in Leviticus chapter 4, sin of ignorance. And it is a violation of God's word. The, the point is this. No, it doesn't separate you from God. But it certainly you'll reap what you sow. And I heard some young people saying, don't tell me, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, because if I don't know, I'm not accountable. It's not wrong, as long as I don't know. And that's what comes from limiting a definition of sin only to what John Wesley wanted to say properly so-called, a willful transgression of a known law of God. And that propagated the view that he who knows least can sin least. So don't read my Bible to get more light. I was going to say, yeah. And I'm sorry, that's not a balanced biblical attitude. That's taking part of the truth and making it the whole truth. So if you don't know that something's wrong and you get light on it, have you ever heard of anybody's talking about walking in all the light and I got new light? Well, that meant I sh God showed me something that would need to be changed in my life that wasn't harmony with the Word of God. So that's what God wants us to do, make adjustments. Walk in the light He gives you. And the more, I've said it before, I'll say it again, the more your life aligns to this book, the more blessing of God will be on your life. And the areas that you're not aligned, even through ignorance, you're still going to reap the choices. And a guy carrying a bag of seed to the fire and not knowing there's a hole in the bag, weed seed. And he's worked hard to get all these weeds out and he doesn't know there's a hole because he doesn't know it's not going to keep those weeds from growing. His ignorance isn't bliss. He's going to be very upset when he finds out through ignorance he caused himself a lot more problems. And so uh, the, I, I don't think we need to fuss over this definition of sin like people have wanted to fuss over it. I think we need to stay away from everything the Bible calls sin and to walk in the light and, and stay as close to Jesus as we can. Amen. Amen. That's good. Uh, 
let me let me let me do this in light of that. Let me give you this illustration and see what you think. Let's just say you have a, an orchard, and there's our property line. I'm on this side. You're on that side. And there's a tree over here has some really good apples on it. And I look at it, and there's the property line. But the apples look really good, and I'm hungry. So I reach across the fence, and I pluck an apple, and I eat it. That's stealing, right? Yes. That's willful. Yes. Okay. Well, that may be ignorant. But it's, if you take it from I didn't me, that's still you. stealing. Okay. I don't know if I'm ignorant or not. We'll let other people determine that. Let's just say that we had a property dispute and the individuals that do the surveying came out and lo and behold, the fence is in the wrong spot. And that fence should have been over here and that apple tree has been my tree all along. So all of the times that I've been plucking your apples, I've been eating my own apples, so I'm off the hook, right? <laughs> That's great. And to complicate matters even further, you have been eating my apples all along. <laughs> Here's what Scripture says. Scripture says that if uh, your tree or bush or whatever uh, hangs over the pathway that people walk, it's okay to pluck it as long as you stay on the path pathway. But you're not permitted to depart from the path. That's not stealing. If you depart from the pathway, go over into his field, take it, that's stealing. I would say uh, concerning your illustration that your motive, why you were doing what you're doing is going to be the deciding factor in whether you're doing right or wrong, even though technically that was your tree the whole time. So who's the one that judges motives? God. Is that kind of what you're saying with all of these issues that may divide us? We see things differently. Not category one fundamental truths, but other issues we're trying to interpret scripture into our life. Is that kind of what you're trying to say that we have to be gracious and kind to one another? We must be gracious and kind and pray for one another. And when they ask, learn the biblical data that you can share with them why you see it the way you see it. Maybe they never have heard the biblical data, and maybe they really are open to the biblical data. So be able to give an answer, Peter says, for the hope that lies, that's not only your salvation hope, I want to apply it to your brother or sister, share the, the wonderful information you've learned with those who may not have yet learned it or had opportunity to learn. Be willing to share and don't get pushed out of shape if they don't immediately say, oh, okay, I'm wrong, you're right. They have to think on it. They have to run it through their mind, pray, and, and you pray for them. And who knows what wonderful things God can do if we would really know how to kindly answer questions and pray for each other instead of judge each other and be critical of each other. Amen. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. So in just a moment, I'm, I'm going to have you say a final prayer for these young people. Be happy to. Young people, we may have talked about some things or some of the questions you've asked may have raised even more questions. That's not a bad thing. As long as your heart is moving in God's direction and you say, I want to be pleasing to God. I want to encourage you to do something. I want you to, I want you to talk to your pastor or your youth pastor. If you have questions, I want you to dig deep into God's word. Talk to your parents 
And I want you to pray that God would shine light into your life. Even on these issues that you may be confused with, just, just give it to the Lord. Allow him to speak. And it may be a year or two years down the road and all of a sudden you might say, oh, that's what I need to do. And then when God shows you, you walk in the light and you will be pleasing to the Lord. Would you say a Amen. prayer of blessing on all yes. these young people this afternoon? Yes. Just before I pray, please, uh, if you're interested in a, uh, some biblical principles that guide your decision, uh, it's out there free. Maybe I should have put $10 each. <laughs> it's free. I'd be sad if they're not taken. Uh, let's pray. Our Father, what a privilege to assemble together to discuss your word. We want to please you. We pray your richest blessings on all of the young people who are gathered here. We are so pleased that they're here. And they're opening their hearts and minds to you. Would you guide them? Would you bless them? Would you provide for them? Would you illumine them? If there are those here that have not yet entered into a personal relationship with you, may this weekend, may today be the day when they fully open their heart to you and turn from what they know is wrong in their life, repent, and invite you in. You'll, do, you'll come in and you'll change them. And I just pray, Lord, that you would encourage all of those who are walking with you and know that their sins are forgiven, strengthen them, uh, bless them, use them, protect them. Uh, life uh, can throw some uh, tremendous uh, problems our way and stresses, but you have promised your grace is sufficient. You'll not allow us to be tempted above what we're able, but we'll, through that temptation, make a way to bear it. Thank you for your great grace. Thank you for your great love. Encourage each one, and may we please you the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Supper's at 4.30. Service begins at 6.30. We'll see you tonight. Lord bless you. <laughs>